A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be in friends. Thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. It is great to have you with us on the program today. We're going to be talking about a a very serious issue here in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, The uh, suicide epidemic in this country, and that really is uh, an epidemic. It is uh, growing. We actually have the highest uh, homicide, or excuse me, the highest suicide rates in the United States since the 1940s, since World War II, uh, and again, we will uh, discuss this uh, with our guest coming up in just a little bit, who has a, a brand new book out uh, all about uh, the uh, suicide crisis. Uh, Dr. Warren Farrell uh, has a book uh, actually called The Boy Crisis, uh, and we'll be discussing that with him coming up in just a few minutes. But first, let's get to some headlines. Uh, starting with a town hall on "quote unquote" gun violence that was held not in Las Vegas on Wednesday. We saw we did see that one. We've talked a lot about that this week. Uh, this one held in Michigan, and it was held at a gun range in Michigan. And a lot of gun owners and members of that range were ticked off because they felt like this event was booked uh, under false pretenses. It was uh, a build as uh, this uh, event to. You know, just kind of uh, apparently it was it was organized by a group called Fem for Life, but it's actually not that organization at all. There were uh, three Democratic lawmakers uh, there in the state of Michigan uh, who were there in attendance at this gun range. One of them ended up uh, just shrieking uh, at the audience. This is why the NRA has to go. That was Representative uh, Haley Stevens. The NRA, she said, has got to go, which doesn't really sound like a conversation. To me, that sounds like yelling at uh, the gun owners who showed up. But she was joined by State House Democratic Leader Christine Gregg, State Representative Robert Wittenberg. Uh, They were calling for things like universal background checks, bans on semi-automatic rifles, quote-unquote red flag laws. There were a lot of gun owners who showed up as well. Uh, According to the uh, uh, local congressional district chair of the GOP, Michonne Maddock, uh, he said, quote, somehow FIMS for Dems booked this event using a different name. He said, the sweet woman I talked to said it was Femmes for Life on her calendar. He said, so we needed to show up and and tell Haley Stevens exactly what we think about her gun violence town hall being held in a a Republican stronghold. And uh, a lot of them did, apparently. Fox 2 in Detroit notes that passions ran high Tuesday evening, uh, quote, stifling the opportunity for meaningful dialogue. Yeah. Uh, Ann Anderson, who's a gun control advocate, says part of the reason why this went the way it did is because you have a lot of people on the extreme end. The reaction from the people here today was starting out from the assumption that that you were going to take my guns. And when you start with that and that fear, it's very hard to have communication. Well, when you have candidates out there like Beto O'Rourke that are talking about taking your guns, when the uh, March for Our Life peace plan that uh, so many Democratic presidential candidates promoted on Wednesday of this week uh, that calls for a ban and a quote-unquote buyback or a compensated confiscation of uh, the most commonly sold rifle in America today. Guess what? Gun owners are going to uh, come into this with questions about, okay, do you support that? Why don't you support that? Do you think this is wrong? Is that something you'd want to do? But I think even more than the gun control items that are offered up by Democratic uh, presidential candidates, if you really do book a, a gun range under false pretenses uh, and want to hold that as, as a uh, you know, use that as a backdrop for your gun control event, yes, the members of that club are going to be angry uh, about being misled or being lied to. That's uh, to use one of the uh, favorite phrases of gun control advocates. That's just common sense. All right, let's uh, get to another story here, our big story today. Uh, my colleague Tom Knighton at Bearing Arms uh, has a story on a new poll out. Uh, that shows how badly misinformed uh, Americans are when it comes to the issue of gun violence. And we've talked about this a bit uh, in the past. You know, the FBI Uniform Crime Reports came out earlier this week showing a drop in violent crime, a drop in homicides from 2017 to 2018. But year in and year out, a majority of Americans believe that violent crime is increasing. So this is a fascinating poll from uh, APM Research Lab uh, asking Americans, okay, so where do the majority of quote-unquote gun violence incidents occur and you can see the results here now the number one answer by far is suicides about two-thirds of gun-related deaths in this country are suicides 
But 33% of the respondents of this poll said, well, it's, it's got to be, you know, murders like gang violence, stuff that's not mass shootings. 25% of the respondents said, well, mass shootings are, are what leads to the most gun-related deaths in this country. 24% accidental discharges. Uh, only 23% of respondents actually correctly identify the fact that suicides by far are the uh, number one, quote-unquote, gun-related death uh, in this country. And if you are unwilling or unable to acknowledge that reality, how can you come up with strategies that are going to effectively reduce suicide? You know, you've got so many gun control advocates that are just trying to lump suicide in with quote-unquote gun violence when I, I believe it truly is a mental health issue. In fact, we've heard gun control advocates say, listen, this is, gun violence is not a mental health issue. Not all of these uh, active shooters uh, are, are mentally ill. That's true. They're not all mentally ill. Would you not consider suicide to be a mental health issue, even if not everybody who commits suicide has been diagnosed with a mental illness? I would think that uh, the demons that drive individuals to try to take their own life, that would be a mental health issue. And yet, so many gun control advocates want to make it simply a firearms issue. So again, we have the opportunity uh, to sit down and uh, speak with a gentleman who has written uh, quite a bit about this. Dr. Warren Farrell is his name. Uh, he has a new book out called The Boy Crisis, Why Our Boys Are Struggling and What We Can Do About It. And the reason why uh, we talked with Dr. Warren about this is because the vast majority of suicides in this country uh, are men. Uh, now, the number of women, particularly middle-aged women, who are taking their own life is rising. But uh, right now, far more than 70 percent, in fact, it's closer to 80 percent of uh, suicides in the United States are men, and so we talked again with um, the author of this brand new book, the uh, the Boy Crisis, uh, Dr. Warren Farrell. Take a look and a listen. Hey, Dr. Farrell, thank you so much, sir, for your time today. It's great talking with you. I'm looking forward to it, based on our uh, pre um, pre talking discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, uh, and and your new book out, uh, the Boy Crisis: uh, Why Our Boys Are Struggling and What We Can Do About It. it you know, it, it's it's fascinating because. It isn't uh, just a boy crisis. Uh, we're now seeing, you know, adult men, as you point out, uh, in 2017, white males accounted for nearly 70 percent of all suicides uh, in this country. Men of color, 8.3 uh, percent uh, of all suicides. This is, and these numbers are are are, are growing. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the FBI came out with its uniform crime stats for 2018, and thankfully, violent crime was down, homicide down by six percent, but the number of suicides, be it by firearm or non-firearm related means, those numbers are at the highest they've been since World War II at the moment. Um, a, that's correct, and B, there are many ways that males commit suicide that are not technically recorded as suicide. They're you know, uh, trying to compete in fast driving because the, the adrenaline rush is more, is more important when you don't care about your life. Um, you know, the X Games, um, doing, doing things that are um, like taking drugs or taking heroin, taking opioids, um, getting, uh, you know, losing themselves in some form of addiction or the, uh, the other that ends in a death. Uh, those are all sort of suicides. Even mass shootings, which we think of as homicides, are almost always end in one of two types of suicides, either a literal suicide or for all practical purpose, the per purpose is the person who does the mass shooting knows that that's the end of his functional life. And so a type of suicide in that respect. And so you're, you're absolutely right. And the suicide rates are, one of the things that is not understood is that what happens to suicide rates when, as you get older and become more male, if you will, um, at the age of nine, um, uh, um, boys and girls commit suicide at exactly the same rate and very minimally, it's rare. Um, between 10 and 14, boys commit suicide at twice the rate of girls. Um, between 15 and 19, boys commit suicide at four times the rate of girls. And between 20 and 25, boys commit suicide at five and a half times the rate of girls. And so you can get some sense as to how, as we learn a combination of learning the male role and having the biological um, additional testosterone, that testosterone, when channeled well, um, becomes the world's most constructive force. Uh, the inventors, the um, you know, the great athletes, um, have a high amount of testosterone, um, but uh, channeled badly, it becomes the world's most de destructive force. Almost all of our mass shooters are, of course, uh, males, 
and 99 to uh, 99% of them are males. And so, but mo what most people don't realize is that they're not only males, uh, they're males who are dad deprived males. The majority of mass shooters are. And the majority of ISIS recruits are not only males, but dad deprived males. And the majority of our prisoners, 93% of our prisoners are males, um, but uh, 90, about approximately 90% of those males are dad deprived males. Now, how do you define dad deprived? Is that somebody where a uh, there, there's no uh, a father or stepfather uh, in the picture at all, or there's limited interaction? Uh, what what how, how do we actually you know drill down and, and, and define that term? Yes, a stepfather. Apparently, you know, the, the research I did. Um, I, I'm a stepdad, and you know, uh, also, and I wanted to find when I started my research for the boy crisis that you know stepfathers were just as good. I was a wonderful stepfather, I thought, and you know, my wife, you know, acknowledged that, and uh, I thought, all right, you know, my children, my daughters have a really good stepfather, and that will really, you know, it, it will make um, all the difference. Well, it, I think, and I, I hope, it did make a significant difference. But the um, but it didn't substitute for the yearning of uh, both of my daughters for um, their biological father to be back in the picture again, and um, and to and that yearning happened in so many ways. And so the biggest contribution I made in the research that I did was sending a draft of um, my first book in this area to my to the um, biological father, and and that inspiring him to get more involved with the children. So. The stepfather is um, so a stepfather being in the picture can be very helpful. Um, there is a, a whole chapter in the boy crisis about how that how that stepfather could be most helpful. If I were to give a one sentence summary of that, it is that the that the great majority of stepfathers never become more than an advisor to the mother. The mother, the biological mother, tends to keep control of the situation, mm -hmm. and therefore the stepfather never really gets to contribute. The nine different, um, the unique contributions that dads tend to make, such as boundary enforcement, such as roughhousing, such as encouraging the children to get outside of their comfort zone, and things like that, that are so important for children to have in balance with the protection and the nurturance that mothers bring. So stepfathers are are very important to be good ones, but it's very uh, you really have to know the di how to avoid the dynamic of having a stepfather just be an advisor. Uh, so uh, back to your original question, the best, maybe the best quick answer is that 53% of American women today um, who have children who are under 30 have children without being married. Now those children um, who, uh, of the, of the non-married um, parents have one of three things happen. They either don't even, nobody knows who their biological father is, or they know their biological father and they know him very um, minimally. And so those would be two examples of dad deprivation. But the third is where the mother and father are living together when the child is born, but the mother, um, but, the, uh, but those children have involvement in any significant way with the biological father for only an average of only about four years. And so, and those children then feel abandoned, um, not necessarily because of the father, not necessarily because of the mother, but because of a dynamic between the father and mother that makes them, you know, not want to live with each other anymore. And then usually a dynamic that leads to the children, the mother wanting to be um, more interested in, in the um, feeling that she wants to move on with her life, to find a better man, quote, a better man. And, um, and then oftentimes that leads to maybe moving with that better man to some place um, uh, out of state uh, and the child goes, children go with them, um, but without realizing how damaging that is to both the bi biological girl and boy, but more to the biological boy um, in 70 plus different answers that I found, uh, 70 plus different ways it's damaging to the boy um, is that, that I discovered in, in my research for the boy crisis. And and so, is it your assertion then that uh, uh, you know growing up in a fatherless home that that uh, increases the risk of suicide? Oh yes, it it is the single biggest predictor of the risk of suicide for for um, males, or, or is that for for, for females too? Uh, for for males, um, I'm actually good question. Um, I'm, I'd have to double check my data on that as to whether that's also true for girls. I know it definitely 
increases the risk of suicide for girls. I'm not positive that it is the single biggest predictor of the risk of suicide for girls. Okay. But it is the, it is the biggest risk of suicide for boys. And here's the dynamic for both boys and girls, but everything I'm going to be saying is just um, like doubled for boys in terms of the impact. The, um, most people are not aware of the differences between dad-style parenting and mom-style parenting. And so um, dads are, for example, um, much more likely to roughhouse than, than moms are. And when a, da- when a dad and child roughhouses, to chil- or the children, let's say three children, and you know the dad maybe will throw the three kids on the couch and say, okay, the game is you guys jump off the, the couch onto my back and you try to pin me down before I pin the three of you down together. Okay, dad, great. You know, and then the, and the mom goes, oh, my God, I feel like I have, you know, I don't want to interfere with this, but I'm feeling like I have just one more child to monitor here. And um, now I have four kids <laughs> playing. And, uh, and then she's thinking, well, yeah, they're having fun. Don't interfere. Uh, you don't want to be controlling. Uh, but on the other hand, I just fear that sooner or later, those, these kids are going to really, um, somebody's going to get hurt. And she's only about 99% likely to be right. <laughs> and so the, uh, the children, you know, jump on the father's back and they, you know, and, they're, and they really get involved with each other. And sooner or later, somebody starts crying. And, uh, and, and mom goes, oh, well, that's terrible, but it's finally he'll learn his lesson. Um, but dad doesn't learn his lesson. He says, you know, Jimmy, you shouldn't have stuck your, um, your uh, elbow in your sister's eye, let's say. And, okay, dad, okay, dad, um, let's go back to roughhousing. Um, you know, but if you do that again, there'll be no more roughhousing. Okay, we got it, Dad. We got it, Dad. Uh, but then they go back to the roughhousing, and then the children experience something that uh, psychologists call emotional intelligence under fire. And this emotional intelligence under fire means that um, you know, the, the, the child usually forgets about the instructions because they're so excited about winning the, the, you know, the wrestling match, of uh, being the kingpin of the kingpinners, let's say. And so, the, um, so they continue that, and then sooner or later, the, so the same basic thing happens again. You know, the one brother pushes the other brother too hard, and um, the other brother starts crying. And so um, da- you know, dad says, you know, oh, that's it. Um, no more roughhousing. Uh, oh, Dad, no, 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 we forgot, you know, that's all right. We didn't really put, I didn't put my elbow in uh, my sister's eye. I just pushed, you know, Jimmy over. Well, that was too hard to push. Um, now the boy is learning the distinction between what is assertive and what is aggressive. And he's also learning empathy, uh, that his ch- his sister and his brother need to be considered, their feelings and fears and their their body needs to be considered as important, not just him winning the wrestling match. All this is data proven. That is, the more the children and fathers roughhouse together, the more empathy the children have. But I've never heard a father say, you know, sweetie, I want to roughhouse with the children because I want to increase their empathy. Um, you know, or I want to increase their assertiveness, not their aggressiveness, or their ability to distinguish between being assertive and aggressive. Dads don't do their homework. They don't speak up about what their, the positive values of their parenting is because they don't know what it is. They can't, therefore, say it to moms. Moms can't hear what dads don't say. So they only see the rough housing or the pe- the kids that get hurt and hold the father as being irresponsible and more like a child, and so they don't. Um, so it's harder for the moms to integrate the the full value of the dads not knowing these things. And but even if she did know these things, it still would be hard. And so um, so that then the dad continues uh, the rough housing that not that night but the following night. The following night, uh, the same um, phenomenon happens, and the following night, the father says, "Okay." No more roughhousing tonight. Um, and that's when the child gets it because they have to, they realize that I'm going to lose what I want to do, the excitement, the roughhousing, the fun, if I don't pay attention to my sister's feelings or the distinction between being assertive versus aggressive. And that's what, and so it, what that child has learned is boundary enforcement. The boundary enforcement has resulted in the child learning postponed gratification assertiveness versus aggressiveness, and uh, empathy. When you have empathy and assertiveness and you understand the distinctions between assertiveness versus aggressiveness, you're far more likely to have friends. When you, um, uh, when, when you are learning that you can't do what you want to do, that is the, you know, win at the game of uh, roughhousing, until you do what you need to do, pay attention to others' feelings, you develop postponed gratification. Postponed gratification is the single biggest predictor of success or failure. The boy or girl without postponed gratification may be very bright, do their homework, 
but they get distracted by a text or an invitation to play a video game or something, and they, they then don't complete their homework. Or they may have a gift as being a musician or an athlete, but they can't, um, they don't rehearse, they don't have the discipline to rehearse the drills or to, you know, to do what is necessary to, um, for the endless hours that you put into becoming a top athlete or a top musician. And so those children learn to dream because the moms are usually very good at nurturing the dreams of the children. But when they, they, when they start practicing those dreams, they tend to fail at their dreams and they become very disillusioned with themselves, ashamed, they start withdrawing. They withdraw into video games or in the case of males in particular, tend to draw into porn because when it comes to boy-girl time, if he's heterosexual, he, the chances are great that girls are not interested in losers. They're interested in winners, which, they, which is really... Uh, performers. Dr. Fair, I'm boys, sorry, I hate uh, to interrupt here, but we're, we're going to run short on time. And I, and I do want to ask yes. you, um, you know, uh, uh, given the, what you've laid out here that, uh, you know, boys needs dad or boy, boys need dads. And I think that, uh, as a father uh, and a stepfather as well, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, we know that, uh, not every family is going to be intact, that there are going to be uh, single parents out there. There are going to be kids that are growing up without a father uh, in, in their life. What 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 can be done, uh, in your opinion, uh, to address and to help those uh, individuals who who don't have that support system, who aren't getting that balance uh, at home? Uh, and 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 you know, are there things that we can do to alleviate? Um, the, 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 the damage that can be done, the, the lessons that aren't learned, uh, and you know, the, 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 the risk factors, uh, that can develop as a result of that. Absolutely. Yes, there are. Fortunately, number one is get your children involved in Cub Scouts, get them involved in Boy Scouts, get them involved in a faith-based community, uh, where the, uh, the faith-based leader um, is helping, is getting your son together with other boys his age where they're all encouraged by the faith-based leader to, um, to talk about what's going on inside of them, what are the, tr the troubles that they're, um, that they're experiencing, what are some of the fears that they have, um, and to find out that other boys have those same fears and then they don't feel so alone and isolated. Um, those, that, that has, those are all proven to be extremely helpful. Um, get them involved in um, initiation groups like the um, Mankind Project, Young Men's Ultimate Weekend. Uh, those are those are very helpful for boys to realize that um, what it takes to become a man, a responsible man, a caring man, and a a man of integrity. Uh, make sure that they are um, involved. Make sure that they are involved with sports, not just team sports. Team sports are the n number one most important, but also um, single sports to uh, like tennis. Uh, single tennis where you don't just learn to play with a team, but you learn how to self-start, like gymnastics and so on. Um, also, uh, pick-up team sports is very important because you learn how to to, um, to create from the beginning, how to choose the persons that you want to play with and judge character and um, and make rules. That's very good preparation for being an entrepreneur, um, which as a boy tends to be a bit of a loner, is very a uh, very important skill set. The most important two things you can do, though, is to understand that the uh, understand that if you do have a stepfather involved, understand how to discover what that stepfather can contribute, and let go of control. Don't do gatekeeping of the stepfather. Otherwise, you'll find that the stepfather will start producing more money, which will be much less valuable to the children than the time. Dad's time always um, trumps dad's time. Um, and the most important thing you can do is to uh, re-examine whether there's any chance of getting the biological father involved, short of him being terribly abusive, etc. A lot of things that mothers consider abusive, like letting the children go to the playground alone or letting them climb a tree too high, are just differences in dad-style parenting versus mom-style parenting. A lot of tough love, what we call tough love, is more likely to be dad-style parenting, but it can be interpreted as not caring about the child but he cares more about watching the playoff than he does about the child. No, he cares. He, he understands that when the child has the experiences at which he fails, um, he just needs the time to process that experience with the child uh, so the child learns from it. He doesn't want to protect the child before the child goes out into the world. He wants to give the child some experiences that he can discuss with the child um, before the child goes out into the world unprotected. That's the way dads, on average, are more likely to think.
All right. Uh, Dr. Warren Fail again. The new book is called The Boy Crisis, Why Our Boys Are Struggling and What We Can Do About It. Uh, Dr. Fail, I appreciate your time today, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate uh, uh, appreciate Dr. Farrell joining us on the program. Let's get to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our uh, recidivism report. I kind of like that. I, I got to tell you, that one's growing on me a little bit. Uh, we'll start there, as a matter of fact. Uh, South Carolina, North Charleston, South Carolina. Check out this headline. Domestic violence murder suspect shot wife once before. Yeah. And what happened? Very little happened. According to Channel 4 News, they say um, uh, Romaine Clare uh, is now accused of uh, shooting and murdering his wife, uh, Ebony. This happened uh, last Thursday. Uh, uh, Ebony Clare uh, was found in her driveway after the shooting. She'd been shot at least twice. She died early last Friday, about six hours after being shot. And uh, her, su- her husband was immediately named as a, a suspect. Uh, he was actually arrested in Florida on Sunday. And uh, Channel 4 News in uh, South Carolina uh, says that a criminal history report provided by the uh, South Carolina Law Enforcement Division shows Romaine Clare was charged by the Hanahan police in December of 2014 with three different felonies after he shot Ebony in the leg amid a dispute at an apartment complex. Uh, at the time, she was Ebony Green. They were not yet married. Uh, he was arrested for that 2004 shooting incident after a brief standoff charged with attempted murder, discharging a firearm into a dwelling in possession of a weapon during a violent crime. He was not convicted of any of those charges. Instead, he was convicted of second degree assault and battery and unlawful carrying of a weapon, which were both misdemeanor charges. The felony charge of firing a gun into a dwelling was dropped altogether. And in September of 2016, uh, judge Christy Harrington sentenced Romaine Clare to three years of probation, ordered him to complete anger management and alcohol counseling. He uh, was also ordered not to have any contact with Ebony Green as part of his sentencing. They were married less than a year later. Unbelievable. So, again, you've got a guy dead to rights, right? The uh, witness... uh, Now, there might have been some trouble with witness cooperation in this case, that, that, that could be the, the, the one thing that may have led to these reduced charges. But again, the physical evidence uh, would likely have been enough to convict uh, Romaine Clare. Instead of years behind bars, he gets three years probation. And that was September of 2016. Here we are just a little more than three years later. And the uh, woman he shot back in 2014 is now dead. And uh, Romaine Clare is now looking at the possibility of a long time behind bars for this crime that made headlines. Uh, Let's get to our armed citizen story of the day from Sherwood, Arkansas. Take a look at this scene here where a uh, police officer arriving on scene. This was an absolutely crazy story. I got to thank my friend uh, Shanti Ananda on uh, Twitter for sending this story along to me. So this was uh, Wednesday afternoon. There was a a pickup truck uh, driving down uh, Highway 67, 167, uh, apparently uh, very aggressively uh, running people off of the road. And then this vehicle ends up uh, uh, crashing. A gentleman named uh, Gene Foster uh, saw what was happening. He stopped to see if he could help. And he saw that uh, the passenger in this white pickup truck uh, got out of the car. He appeared, quote, lethargic. He said he had a cell phone in his hand, and then he started searching around on his body. The uh, driver was uh, stuck inside the truck. Other people involved in the crash appeared to be okay. Uh, Gene Foster ended up uh, pulling his firearm, legally owned firearm, and holding that individual there on the ground until police arrived. Uh, When police showed up, Uh, After searching that truck, officers found, quote, 34 grams of a white powdery substance. Could be meth, could be heroin, could be fentanyl, we don't really know. Uh, Could be, you know, talcum powder, I suppose. Seems kind of unlikely. A half-empty bottle of whiskey, 10 credit cards that belong to other people as well, found in that uh, white pickup truck. Uh, Two individuals, Derek and Brian Allen, both arrested on multiple felony charges there. And the uh, armed citizen who got involved, Mr. Foster, uh, 
not facing any charges, getting thanks from uh, local law enforcement for helping out. Now, our uh, good deed of the day from Kingsport, Tennessee, where the uh, father of a four-year-old ended up walking away from an elementary school uh, is thanking the Good Samaritan who brought her home. I got to tell you, this story brings me back. When I was two years old, I don't remember this, but uh, this was family lore. Uh, when I was two, my family moved from Massachusetts to Oklahoma. And we probably, I don't know, maybe three months after we moved, uh, we had a little dog and we had a backyard and we had a backyard with a gate on it. Somehow I unlatched the, uh, the gate and I got out with my little dog. Uh, puppy at the time, and we started walking. Uh, and my mom was flipping out. She went out to uh, bring me in for lunch, and I wasn't in the backyard. She didn't know what to do. She called the police. They're searching around. They found me about almost a mile away. Uh, and there were these two very nice elderly ladies who saw me walking down the middle of a four lane road with my dog. Uh, and they stopped, and I was freaking out. I didn't know where I lived, I couldn't tell them my address. They ended up following my little puppy dog home uh, and returning me. So my dog was actually the Good Samaritan in that story. In this particular story, uh, you've got a two-legged uh, Good Samaritan. Four-year-old Olivia Collins wandered off from Abraham Lincoln Elementary School in Kingsport on Wednesday. About a quarter mile from the school, uh, a Good Samaritan saw her. Uh, Alyssa Hunter says, I came up to her like, hey, are you okay? Where's mommy and daddy? She, too, Olivia was freaking out and bawling. Um Alyssa Hunter says that Olivia was able to direct her to her home, which is, uh, that's great, actually. Uh, Jason Collins told uh, News Channel 11 there, WJHL, that he walks his daughter to school every morning, says that she knows the route home, uh, and that helped after she ended up leaving the building. Alyssa Hunter didn't know the Collins family until this week. Olivia's dad said uh, she went out of their way, made sure my daughter was being taken care of and got home safely. Uh, No words to express how thankful my wife and I are. They are still trying to figure out how their daughter managed to uh, escape the uh, the school. Uh, she said we could come up with, or he said we could come up with some uh, resolutions where no other family, no other parent leave the school where they're supposed to be safe, uh, where they are supposed to be educated. Kingsport City School says they are uh, currently investigating that incident. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Thank you again for being a part of the program. Now, Monday morning, it's very possible that uh, we could learn from the Supreme Court what the future holds for New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus New York City. Is this case going to proceed to oral argument on December the 2nd? Uh, will the case be mooted as New York City and New York State and gun control activists around the nation have been demanding, as Democrat senators have been threatening? Uh, we'll talk with attorney Steve Hallbrook about that on Monday's Cam and Company. Have a fantastic weekend. Thanks again for being a part of the program. And of course, you can always get the show as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, townhall.com podcast. You can subscribe to Town Hall Media on YouTube and you can make sure to get the latest Bearing Arms Cam and Company each and every day. We do appreciate you watching, listening, and spreading the word. And we'll see you back here Monday with another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company.